let's take a look at some variation and change in languages. So one thing I want you to understand from this lecture is that language always changes. It always has and it always will as long as we have people speaking those languages. Okay? So variation and change are just a part of having languages. Variation often means the differences within a language family. So when we talk about English, um, there are variations both in the different types of Englishes, so across dialects of English, but then also within a variety itself. So American English has multiple dialects as well. Uh, we think of Southern English or Northeastern English or Intermountain English as being different varieties of the same language. Same language because we can understand one another. Okay, and varieties often develop to service some need of the speakers. So uh, this is a family tree, of a uh, language family tree. We're only looking at Indo-European languages. We're not looking at all the languages of the world. Um, but you can see that there was this language, pro we call it Proto-Indo-European, that most of the European-based languages came from uh, this, this one language. And if you follow down the different, uh, the different arms, so as we go into Celtic, you can see that we have uh, what we have now as, as Welsh and Gaelic are probably some languages that are familiar to you. Um, as we go to the other side on the Italic side, goes to Latin. And uh, Latin uh, gave birth to a lot of languages that we know today um, that are still spoken today all over. Um, a relative of the Latin languages is German. And so German um, has multiple branches. It's a little bit more complicated than the Latin branch. Um, but in the Germanic branch, we have, uh, we have different types of German um, that spread out to different places. So you can see uh, where we have uh, like Dutch and Afrikaans. Over here we have Danish and Swedish and the more Scandinavian languages, which also tells us why even though both Danish and Dutch came from German, they don't sound exactly like German. Um, I can actually understand both of those a little bit from German, um, but Danish speakers and Dutch speakers often can't understand one another, even though both of them can understand some things of German. Okay, we can also see the, the English branch. So English comes through through as a Germanic language. Okay, we are related to those um, other Indo-European languages, um, but not as closely as we're related to German. So we're considered a Germanic language. Okay. To demonstrate um, how language changes in the, in the family of languages, I wanna show you this little um, excerpt that comes out of a book. It's an elementary German series. My brother actually introduced this to me when I was very young and was going to start taking German. He wanted to show me that German was not that different from what we knew as English. And so he had this passage that he shared with me that I'm going to share with you, or part of it with you, um, to see how things are quite similar. Okay? So it's about the family, okay? the title at the top, Die Familie, um, it's about the family. Okay? And it goes like this. Ich habe einen Vater und eine Mutter. Der Vater und die Mutter sind meine Eltern. Ich habe einen Großvater und eine Großmutter. Mein Großvater und meine Großmutter sind meine Großeltern. Mein Großeltern von Mutterseite leben noch. Meine Großeltern von Vaterseite leben nicht mehr. Meine Eltern haben zwei Kinder, eine Tochter und einen Sohn. Die Tochter ist meine kleine Schwester. Der Sohn bin ich. Das heißt, meine Schwester hat nur einen Bruder und ich habe nur eine Schwester. Der Bruder meines Vater oder meines Mutter ist mein Onkel. Die Schwester meines Vater oder meines, meine Mutter ist meine Tante. Ich habe nur einen Onkel. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Um, so I didn't quite finish the whole pa pa uh, passage, um, but I think that there are some words in there that you will have understood. I'm going to go through it again and try to help you understand a little bit more. Okay, some of the words that we can tell where English developed from those things. So it starts with the word ich, okay? Ich habe, I have, ich habe eine Vater, father, und eine Mutter, mother. Der Vater und, and, die Mutter sind meine Eltern. Uh, the word Eltern doesn't really look uh, too similar to parents. Um, however, it could be related to the word, word elders, okay? Ich habe einen Großvater, und eine Großmutter, so grandfather and grandmother. Okay? Meine Großvater und meine Großmutter sind meine Großeltern. Meine Großeltern von Mutterseite, okay, of mother's side or from mother's side, leben noch, uh, live still. 
meine Großeltern von Vaters Seite, so from my grandparents from my father's side, leben nicht mehr, no more. Okay. Meine Eltern haben zwei Kinder, two children, eine Tochter, a daughter, und einen Sohn, son. Die Tochter ist meine kleine Schwester. The daughter is my little sister. Schwester is sister. Der Sohn bin ich. The son is I. Das heißt, or I mean, meine Schwester hat nur einen Bruder und ich habe nur einen Schwester. So the sister has only one brother and I have only one sister. Okay. Der Bruder meines Vaters oder meine Mutter ist mein Onkel. The brother of my father or my mother is my uncle. Die Schwester, the sister, meines Vaters oder meine Mutter ist meine Tante. So the father or the brother of my father and my mother is my uncle. The sister of my father or my mother is my aunt. Okay? Um, then it says, ich habe nur einen Onkel. I only have one uncle. Okay, and we could go on, but you can see that lots of these words are very similar to the words that we still use today in English. So, as English moved away from German, some of the things stayed and some of the things changed. Okay, let's talk about some variation and change inside of English. Okay, um, old English um, had, had uh, the word thou, which is a word you've probably heard before, but it's not one we use in regular speech, had a word thou and had the word you. You meant you, plural, and thou meant you, singular. So just one you, if you're talking to someone. Okay? Or if you're talking to a group, you'd use you. If you're talking to one person, you'd use thou. In the 13th century, the you that was plural starts to become singular as well. Okay? So now we have an alternation between thou, which is singular, which it has been for a long time, and you, which we can now use as singular or plural. Okay? It probably starts out only sometimes as singular. It, by the 16th century, the separation between those two words becomes very distinct, and we have what's called a tu-vu distinction. Tu-vu comes from the French, um, you and you, um, and it's a you informal, like I'm talking to my best friend or a little child, or you formal, like I'm talking to my boss or my parents. Okay? So you have two when you're talking to someone that's close to you, or thou. So we would use thou for our best friend, and we would use you for someone that we had never met. Okay? Which is actually the reverse of how we might view the word thou today. So thou was very informal during the 16th century, where now when we hear the word thou, because it's old, it seems very formal. Um, but it was not back in the 16th century. By the 17th century, thou completely disappears, and we use you for both informal and formal situations, and now both singular and plural situations. Okay. So when things change, um, our perceptions uh, don't always match what's going on. Okay. So here's a quote from Sir John um, Czech in 1557, and he said, I am of the opinion that our own tongue should be written in clean and pure, unmixed and unmangled with borrowings of other tongues. Basically what he's saying is that English should be pure without all of these impurities that come from other languages. Uh, what's interesting about this particular quote is the underlined words are actually from French. Um, they were borrowed into English um, and kept in English, but they actually have French uh, background. So while he's saying that English should remain clean and pure, the words he's using are not even English but instead are borrowings from other languages. Okay? So as we have multiple varieties that exist, then we start to have perceptions of what is correct and what is not correct. And we have standards emerge that will tell us what we can and cannot do with different languages. Okay? So standards meaning like a dictionary. So there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong, um, even though some varieties might have used um, both both forms, both the correct, the correct with quotes, um, or incorrect versions. Okay, so here's an example. 
Um, I'm going to introduce the word prescription. Prescription is like a dictionary um, or like what a language teacher would tell you you must do uh, versus use, which is what people actually do. Here are two English sentences. The first sentence, yesterday was a great conversation between he and I. The second sentence, yesterday was a great conversation between him and me. If you're a native English speaker, okay, now I say that why do we use this term native English speaker, but now here I'm using it, um, is because if you're not a native English speaker, you may not have the same intuitions. But if you have spoken English for a long enough time and you learned it early enough, then your brain gives you an idea of which one of these sentences is correct. For some of you, both are correct. For some of you, very strongly, one is correct over the other, okay? And in fact, the prescriptively correct sentence is the second sentence. Yesterday was a great conversation between him and me. So if I want to speak correctly, the correct form of English, I would say the second sentence. But many, many English speakers use sentence number one. Okay? In fact, sentence number one, I believe, is more used and more people think that that's correct than the second one. Okay? Even though our rules tell us that it must be number two. Okay? I know that it's number two for this reason. Okay? This starts to sound a little bit pedantic, but I want to explain to you why it's one over the other. Okay? So when we have the word between, between is a preposition. And whatever comes after the preposition is considered the object of the preposition. Okay? And it needs to be an objective case. Now, in English, we have very few examples of... We don't have any examples of nouns where they're in different cases, whether they're the subject or the object, but our pronouns are different. He is the subject case and him is the object case. So in this case, because it comes after the preposition and it's an object of a preposition, then it actually needs to be in the objective case. Okay? So the first sentence where we have subject forms of he and I after a preposition, those are incorrect. Now, why does it sound correct to so many of us? Well, it sounds correct to us because many of us grew up with our parents saying, or parents or teachers saying things like, no, it's he and I, he and I, he and I, trying to correct when we say me and him. Um, so they are correcting us, telling us that the I needs to come second. Um, and we use I when it's in the subject position, that's correct. Um, but when it's in the object position, we actually need to use me. So many of us have inside of our mental grammars, inside of our heads, this rule that tells us we should always use he and I. That's correct. And that him and me is somehow wrong. Okay? Um, and yet the prescriptive rule says that between him and me is correct. So you can imagine, um, I teach grammar all the time, and so sometimes I use the correct uh, forms because that's what I'm teaching and explaining the differences. So when I use, yesterday was a great conversation between him and me, and someone corrects me because they are much smarter than I am at grammar, um, it sounds, uh, I sound like a jerk when I say something like, well, actually it is between him and me because uh, him is the object form and it comes after a preposition and is, is the object of a preposition. So him and me is actually correct. But for many of us, hearing between him and me makes us think that it sounds a little less educated. And we think it sounds smarter to say he and I. Okay? So here are some exa examples of how variation exists, but how we might have perceptions about different sentences. Okay? Let's talk about another change. In the United States, we have going on what's called a vowel merger, which is where two sounds are becoming one sound. Okay? It's active. It happens all over the place. I say that I don't do it, but I catch myself periodically doing it. Okay? So we could have a word like pin and a word like pen, and those two would start to sound the same. Or a word like fill and a word like feel, and they would again start to sound the same, somewhere in between those two sounds. So it's the i e merger and the i e merger. Okay? Um, I noticed myself doing it when I was singing a Christmas song that says, Christmas is a feeling filling the air. And when I said it quickly, both of those vowel sounds were the same. 
Okay? Um, the reason we can do that, the reason we can make a change like this is because I only need to specify sounds and words as much as you need to understand what I mean. So if it's in a context where you can understand what I mean, even if I use the incorrect vowel sound, you're still going to understand, then I'm going to use the sound that's the easiest for me to produce, which often means the same sound that's somewhere else in the sentence. Okay. Here's another example of change. So from B British English to American English, um, in British English they say, have you got any pens? In fact, they use have you got for almost all of their questions. In American English, we use do you have any pens? We always include do support. In fact, it's our preferred way to make a question. So when I went to Europe for the first time and was working with very young English language learners, um, they were always using this expression, have you got any, have you got any? And my perception of that expression is that it's somehow less educated. Like they learned it from someone who um, hasn't had a formal education in the United States. And I thought it was very strange that they were using that, that construction. However, they thought it was strange that I was using do you have because they never heard that before. It didn't make sense to them. Um, and when I looked at their textbook and realized it was British English um, instead of American English, I felt kind of silly that I had perceived them as somehow learning from someone who did not have as much education when in fact they were just learning British English, which is very different from standard American English. Okay. When American English broke off from the British, there are some reasons why that happened. The main reason is that we just stopped liking all things British. The second thing that occurred is we had a standardization of informal speech and a leveling of social dialects. For me, these two things are related uh, because in the United States, people are wanting things to be more equal, not as stratified as they were in Europe. And so as they start to try to make people more equal and the ways of speaking more equal, then um, they start to break away from some of the British language things. Okay, the other thing that happens is we have different interactions with foreigners. Um, the foreigners that we're communicating with or the non-English speakers we're communicating with are a little bit different from the non-foreigners that Britain is communicating with. And as we're communicating with non-English speakers, we're also changing our language to match them. But if you think about the places in the United States that still have a little bit of carryover from British English, um, those are places that remained loyal to Great Britain during the Revolution. So they, on purpose, wanted to still sound British, where, in contrast, the rest of the colonies started to separate themselves from, uh, from wanting to sound British. Okay. So again, the, the purpose is languages change all the time. Okay, don't forget that. Um, we're always surprised that they change, but they do. Okay? And as languages change, we often get upset. Okay? We often hear older generations talking about the younger generations and how they just don't speak correctly anymore. Okay? So here are some questions for you to think about with this variation and change. One is why is it that we view some varieties as better than others? Right? Why is it that I view some of them as being higher educated and lower educated when education may not have anything to do with it? Okay? And how do I feel about people who speak varieties that are not prestigious? So varieties that I view as lower in social class, why do I view those people as lower as well? And why do I even view those varieties as lower? Okay? How do you think German speakers felt about the first English speakers? As English started to break away from German, how do you think Germans felt about those English speakers? I'm guessing that they had pretty negative attitu attitudes toward their ability to speak. Okay? And how was American English viewed by the British speakers? Okay? Pretty much the same thing. In fact, today it's often viewed the same way. British speakers view American English as being some sort of break off and uh, less than British English, like we've ruined it. Okay? And we might hear some other varieties of English where we say, oh, they've really ruined English. Okay? Over the semester, we'll learn how they came to be the way they are. Okay? One more thing that we need to talk about from these chapters in our textbook is about English as a lingua franca. So English is often used as the language of communication when speakers do not share a common language. 
Okay, so this is true when we have like a Chinese native speaker uh, visiting in Germany for holiday and they're with some German speakers. Um, if the Chinese speaker doesn't speak German and the German speaker doesn't speak Chinese, then they probably will switch to some sort of English um, to communicate as a lingua franca. Okay. So I want to tell you how this came to be in Australia in particular. So here's our map of Australia and you can see places where English is spoken and you can see places where English is not spoken. What is interesting about all the languages that are here um, in Australia is most of them are not dialects of the same language. They are not as close as British English and American English. They are in fact different languages. So kind of like someone speaking German and someone speaking Spanish, right? We saw in our family tree that they are related, but I don't know too many Spanish speakers who can understand a German speaker when they're speaking German. So even though they're related, they're not close enough that they can understand one another. They are not mutually intelligible. Okay, so as we have this separation of languages, let's talk about what happens um, as English comes into contact. Okay, so we use this word pidgin to talk about a contact language. Okay, pidgins and creoles arise in the context of temporary events or enduring traumatic social situations. So we see pidgins happen during trade and during things like slavery, wars, colonialism. I always prefer to talk about them in terms of trade because trade for me is a much more positive uh, way to talk about it. Um, these languages, these Englishes or these pigeons are often stigmatized but they provide an insight into how amazing it is that humans have the ability to adapt their language. Okay? So what we have happening in Australia is we have English, let's say English traders coming from Great Britain, coming into contact with a bunch of Aboriginal languages. So as they come into contact with those languages, they start to create this pidgin. Okay? A pidgin takes on the vocabulary from the high status language, the language with power, money, um, and a military, okay? and the pronunciation and structure come from the lower status language. So now we have this pidgin developing that uses vocabulary from English, but some of the pronunciation features and some other um, features from the other languages that exist there in Australia before English was present. Okay. But as they come into contact, um, we also have other language borrowings that happen. Okay. Over time, the language becomes more codified. So you think about it, English is having contact with these different Aboriginal languages over um, a period of, let's say, 100 years, um, which is probably not even close to the right number, um, but over 100 years they're having contact, and with each of those different languages they're creating some sort of a pidgin. The local speakers are wanting to communicate with the English speakers, often for trading purposes. Think of when you go on a vacation somewhere where they don't really speak very much English, but the shopkeepers all can say something, right? They can all say something like very cheap price, very cheap price, come see, come see. Um, they can't carry on a conversation, but they know the key words to communicate with you to get what they want from you, okay? That's how a pigeon starts. Um, and often, because the high status speaker or the person with the money is unwilling to learn the native dialects. Okay? Remember, that's not part of Karen's perfect world. We would learn everyone's language. Okay? So over time, the language becomes more codified, meaning that it becomes more regularized. And if children start to learn it, um, then their brains, which are primed for learning a language, they actually start to fill in the structure um, and make it a full language. And it becomes a language for them that has all of the same structures that my language, my American English has for me. Okay? It, it no longer is that temporary partial language, but becomes a full language. Okay? So then we go back to our map of Australia where we have all these different dialects or languages spoken and they can't understand one another, but they have all been communicating with me, the English speaker who's come in to buy things. And when they start to try to communicate with one another, they recognize that they can use this pidgin English that they have created to speak with one another. So over time, okay, and we're talking 
you know, many, many years, many generations, over time, those become regularized languages that don't sound like my language that started out with, but has lots of the vocabulary that was my language, but starts to take on features of their own languages, but they can use it to communicate with one another. They use their home language at home and for all of their other tasks, but they use English as a lingua franca the same way as a Chinese speaker communicating with a German speaker. Now we have speakers of different native dialects communicating with each other in English. Okay? But it's a special kind of English that doesn't look or sound exactly like mine. It starts to take on its own features. And it's a little bit different as well from regular Australian English that's spoken in Australia too. Okay? But because it's so far away from those original contact languages, it changes. And the languages it comes in contact with help it change.